you know, another thing I'm watching out for in 2024 is the Chinese banking sector and the fallout from the commercial real or the real estate collapse in China. Well, you've got this century old conflict over this island. It really resembles the Falklands a lot in that way. And well, how do you distract people from losing everything in the real estate market? Give them somebody to shoot at and reflect that anger outwards. So that that's it's a very dangerous thing, I think, that geopolitically, the world is a tinderbox right now. Co-64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So this is another one of my uh, Christmas or holiday interviews. Uh, I've got one of my favorite YouTubers, Jack Gamble of Nobody Special Finance. Uh, Jack, how are you? I'm good, Mario. Thanks for having me on. It's good to see you again. Great, great to see you too. And before we start, Jack, I just wanted to show the viewers where they can find you on, on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed to uh, Nobody Special Finance, I, I recommend you do. Uh, really good content. It look, you're doing quite a few lives almost every day, aren't you, uh, Jack? Yeah, I do a morning live stream a half hour before the opening bell on every business day. I do a live stream to cover the the news and what markets are doing ahead of the opening bell. And then I do also interviews. And if there's a newsworthy event out there, I'll do a video about that as well. So, Great, great. And uh, so, Jack, one of the reasons I wanted to speak with you is because I'm in the UK. You know, I, I do follow what's going on everywhere around the world. But uh, you being in the US and New Jersey, which is a an interesting place to be. I mean, it's uh, near New York. It's kind of, I'm not saying it's provincial, but it's its not like metropolitan. Just wanted to get your take on what's going on there and uh, in the US and what are the prospects for 2024 uh, economically, politically, and socially. So maybe we start with the economic uh, uh, components. Yeah. Well, uh, minor correction, I grew up in New Jersey, but I actually live in Pennsylvania now, not too far from New Jersey. Um, my wife and I, we both worked in commercial nuclear power. We worked at a nuclear power plant, and New Jersey is a notoriously blue state, and the state politics drove the plant out of business, forced the early shutdown of the plant. We both lost our jobs on the same day, so we moved out to Pennsylvania looking for work, as so many people do in a state like New Jersey, where the government puts people out of work, and then they flee and they take their tax base with them. So we are part of the migration out of the blue. We didn't move south. We moved more into a purple state, Pennsylvania. Uh, but that's where we're at now. It's it's a story you see repeating pretty, pretty often in the United States. As far as economically in 2024, I can tell you the biggest thing that I'm watching, or I think the, the the most important singular data point you could watch in 2024 is going to be unemployment in the U.S., uh, especially in the context of the Federal Reserve meeting that we just got yesterday. I'm not sure when this interview is going to air, but we are one day removed from Jerome Powell's, in my opinion, his surrender that we got yesterday. I think you used the phrase, he folded like a cheap suit on yeah, your show that, today. That was actually uh, Lawrence Leppard. Is it Lepard? Sorry, I was get that name uh, confused. Uh, he he said that on on X or Twitter. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So if rate cuts are indeed coming, and it, it it looks like they are, yesterday the Fed said probably three rate cuts coming in 2024. That was in their dot plot or the summary of economic projections. The market is actually pricing in six rate cuts in 2024 now, and historically rate cuts, notably the first rate cut starts the clock on a massive spike in unemployment. We've seen that virtually every time the Fed has ended a tightening cycle and gone back to a easing cycle, that within three to six months, you get a massive spike in unemployment. And so if we do see the first rate cuts early next year, that means within a few months, we're going to start seeing sharp rises in unemployment here in the States. We're already starting to see small increases in unemployment. You know, we we went from the low low one one point X, and now we're up to we went as high as three point nine. We ticked down a little bit last month to three point seven percent unemployment. But the Federal Reserve is saying right now that we think we've nailed the soft landing. We don't think unemployment will go above four point one percent, and we can still achieve two percent inflation. Well, we're only. 0.4% away from that 4.1% target that they're telling us. And historically, unemployment spikes to an average of about 7.5% following rate cuts. 
So I think that's the important one to watch there. And of course, along with unemployment goes the housing market, which housing in the United States has just risen to such obscene levels of unaffordability with the average person now paying mid 40, like about 45% of their take home pay in shelter, uh, what be it rent or mortgage payments, that is just historically untenable. There, there's no way we can maintain that level of pricing and shelter costs, especially if we start to see unemployment rise, because when people lose their jobs, they don't pay their rent and they default on their mortgages. And that would start the cascade of foreclosures and lower home prices. So unemployment, I think, is the key to watch in 2024. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting you said that the Fed sees a soft landing and that uh, unemployment won't go up. But uh, at the same time, they're, they're seeing three uh, rate cuts. The market is seeing six. Uh, I guess they haven't done their uh, homework to see. Uh, you know That shows that when you cut rates like that, it, it's the beginning of a recession, a crisis. Uh, or even worse. So um, where do you think the, uh, I mean, not that the unemployment rate matters. It does matter, but, it, you know, they only count uh, the number of people that uh, are, are looking for, for a job. And they don't count the number of people that have, uh, you know, have stopped looking for a long time. So where do you think this uh, unemployment rate might spike to. Do you, do you think we will start seeing negative non-farm payroll uh, numbers as well? Yes, I do think we'll start to see negative non-farm payrolls probably very soon. We'll start to see them. I just lost your picture, Mario. Are we? Do I still have you there? Uh, yeah. Okay. You want me to... I'll uh, restart. Can you see me now? Or... I do. Yeah, I'll I'll restart my answer. That's all right. Uh, I do think we'll start to see negative non-farm payrolls probably pretty soon. I mean, the, the non-farm payrolls numbers, i.e. the jobs report that we get once a month here in the States, we've seen that come down. Earlier in the year, we were getting 500,000 numbers, 400,000 numbers. Now we're down to 199,000 jobs added in the most recent non-farm payrolls, plus the constant downward revisions to prior non-farm payrolls. So you, you already see that we're trending in that direction. And we're also starting to see increases in the anecdotes of job losses. Just in the last few days, like yesterday, we saw Etsy announce they're laying off, I think, 10% or 20% of their workforce. Layoffs from Hasbro, the world's biggest toy maker, laying people off two weeks before Christmas. That was just announced this week. I mean, <laughs> talk about a Santa Claus rally. Toy makers cutting jobs right ahead of Christmas. Not the best indicator. Um, we're also seeing, I think we're going to see layoffs in automotive sectors because people can't afford cars. Ford just announced yesterday that they're going to be cutting back electric vehicle production for their F-150 Lightning by about 50%, even though they just spent the money to enhance capacity at the plant that makes them by triple. So not to mention the big UAW contracts that were just signed as a result of the strike. So we're probably looking at job losses there. Uh, the thing about the anecdotes of job losses and the announcement of layoffs, they usually come with a severance attached. And as long as somebody is collecting a severance, they don't go on the unemployment rolls. So we'll start to hear those stories about thousands of people losing jobs here and there, kind of like we did earlier in the year in January with all the layoffs in tech and then eventually in finance. But it will take several months for that to translate into higher unemployment as people are working down their severance. So probably we don't see the spike until second, maybe even third quarter of next year, assuming we get our first rate cuts in the first quarter. So it seems to me that um, the Fed's trying to uh, also keep uh, rates from going up too high. And that's why they've come out with this uh, dot plot chart that looks like they're going to cut. The market is uh, discounting cuts. And, and uh, a month or so ago, maybe more, Yellen uh, spoke about issuing less long-term paper. And ever since then, yields have gone down. Um, do you expect that to create some kind of uh, bounce back in the economy? See, would that translate, uh, do you think, to a, a lot lower uh, mortgage rates uh, and credit card uh credit card rates or uh is this just for uncle sam where where rates are going down i i don't think we're going to see 
any benefit whatsoever to your average middle class, what's left of the middle class in the United States. I don't think they see any benefits from these rate cuts, maybe a little bit in the form of their 401k. Uh, but as far as street level, you know, the average income versus expenses, no, I don't think you're going to see any benefits. You may actually see more harm done, especially to like, say the millennials and the Gen Zers, those people who have been trying to save up for a house. I don't know what to tell those people right now because shelter costs, like I mentioned, are already about 45% of their income. Now what happens, it, I mean, what they just did is starting to juice asset prices already. Yesterday we saw gold, silver, Bitcoin, stocks, bonds, everything rallied. I would assume that's gonna translate into higher house prices too. So what do you tell somebody who's been saving up to buy a house now? Uh, so I think this will probably hurt the main, main street as much as it helps. Um, it will certainly aid in the wealth transfer from middle class to ruling class, right? Because what we're seeing now is the early indicators of a second wave of inflation. Inflation hits in a very predictable path. At first, it hits asset prices. Saw that yesterday. Then it hits consumer prices. And lastly, it hits wage prices. And you know, we, we've had this rinse repeat cycle since the 1970s where they lower rates and print money, juices asset prices, that results in consumer price inflation. And then right as people start to get wage increases, the Fed says, no, 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 rate hikes, puts people out of work and we get the spike in unemployment. So the wages never rise. We're not even finished with that third phase of the prior inflation cycle, which we're still in, and they're already starting the next one by juicing asset prices like they did yesterday. So I definitely don't think the Main Street is going to see any benefit from this. If nothing else, it's going to be worse for them. Yeah, I wanted to share something uh, related to that. It's the uh, M2. Unfortunately, we can't get M3 because the Fed <laughs> stopped publishing it years ago. And uh, you can see here that uh, in 2020, it jumped massively from below $16 trillion to I don't know, it was around 22 trillion almost. And it has come off, you know, that's actual deflation, you know, the true definition of deflation. But, you know, uh, it's kind of stabilized of late. And now, you know, basically they pivoted and this, this should start going back up. And I've drawn this line here, which was the previous trend. And uh, we're nowhere near uh, to getting back to trend, which would be, you know, uh, around 18 trillion. So that's why I, I agree with you that we're going to continue to see, you know, uh, a second wave of uh, pr price rises because the inflation has never really gone away here, as you can see. You know, one thing that's important to note, especially in this chart, for the last year and a half, you know, the banking crisis in the spring notwithstanding, we have seen the money supply shrinking as your chart's showing. You know, you, you do see that little bounce on the way down. That was the banking crisis and some of the money that was injected, some of the liquidity the Fed injected to save the banks in March and then again in May. Uh, but while this has been happening, while the money supply has been technically contracting, which you're correct is a textbook definition of deflation, a retraction in the money supply, we haven't seen deflation in prices, which is the alternate definition of deflation is widespread contraction in prices. We haven't seen that. Because as the money supply has been shrinking, a big chunk of that new money supply, which was not in circulation, has been re-entering circulation in the form of the reverse repo, which has been drawing down. Reverse repo went as high as $2.5 trillion last year. And that's money that was printed during the great monetary expansion that we saw during the pandemic. But that money never really circulated. It went into money markets. And from the money markets, instead of bidding up U.S. Treasury prices or bidding up asset prices, they just parked it at the Fed in exchange for a free 5% interest. And so that money has essentially been on Mars. Not It has been driving up the total money supply, but the effective money supply that's actually circulating, it hasn't participated in that. So even though M2 has come down as the Fed has done their quantitative tightening and their rate hikes, Ever since the U.S. suspended the debt ceiling and Janet Yellen started issuing more short-term Treasury bills, we have seen that reverse repo money has left reverse repo. It's gone from two and a half trillion peak in December of last year to about eight hundred and twenty billion or so. It's where it's at today. That money has re-entered circulation, 
So the effect of the reverse repo money re-entering circulation has been inflationary, effectively inflationary in that it's bidding up asset prices as it flows back into the bond market and the T-bill market, even though the total money supply, which includes the reverse repo, has been shrinking. So we haven't really yet felt that contracting money supply because on the street level, the reverse repo has been offsetting in that. Now the reverse repo is almost gone. There's 820 billion left. That's another thing I'm looking for in 2024 is what's going to be the impact of that hitting zero. And they they did address that a little bit with the Fed yesterday. And Powell made the subtle suggestion that the end of quantitative tightening might be tied to a certain level in the reverse repo. He didn't say what that level was, but he made some comments at the very end of the press conference when he was asked by one of the reporters you know, they said that they would stop quantitative tightening before we reach a level of ample reserves in the banking system. And the question, the answer was posed in relation to reverse repo. I forget the exact wording that they used, but he suggested that there is a level that the reverse repo would hit where they will begin to slow their quantitative tightening and then eventually stop it. So that's another thing to watch out for in 2024. Well, that, that could mean that uh, the quantitative tightening could slow down prior to like uh to march next year because if you look at the trend in the uh reverse repo uh it's pointing to middle of middle end of february uh going going to zero so that's quite interesting um maybe we could uh, move over into uh the geopolitical and political uh aspects uh, start with the political. <laughs> it's interesting that we are all talking about the Fed. I spoke the, about the Fed this morning, but I, I also noticed that the Congress, uh, well, the Republicans really voted to start an impeachment process of uh, President Biden. And it seems like you said earlier, impeachment is not serious anymore. <laughs> I, I, I remember, you know, uh, when Bill Clinton was impeached because of the Lewinsky scandal, it was huge news. I think he was the first president uh, to be impeached since uh, they uh, threatened to impeach Nixon and then he resigned. But now it seems like Trump was impeached a couple of times. Uh, do you see this as a problem or is it just a symptom of more division uh, amongst Americans? And how would that impact, uh, you know, fiscal policy, the economy going forward? Yeah, I, I think you hit the, the nail on the head there. It is a symptom of division and of the ridiculous state of politics in the United States and dare I say globally, um, but particular here in the States. I mean, you know, let, let me just comment on the use of impeachment without commenting so much on the specific cases, not trying to take sides here. You could probably guess where I lay on the political spectrum. Um, the second impeachment of Donald Trump, he wasn't even in office. He had already left office. He had already lost re-election. They, they, they impeached the president for the second time who wasn't even the president. Right. So any value the 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 practice the of impeachment had just went out the window. It became a circus at that point. And the same thing the the other impeachment versus some of the other things that impeachment has been reserved for in the past it, it they have cheapened it through its overuse right and 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 that works just like the money supply the more you use it the more of it you create the less value of it there is and now like i am not necessarily a fan of the roomba that is currently residing in the white house i mean you, you watch that guy He's got the nuclear codes and he gives a speech and then he wanders around the stage in each direction wondering how to get off the stage. That's the thought process. I mean, cognitive decline meets cognitive dissonance. Am I a fan? No. Should he be impeached? Look, they're all, I don't know how, how to phrase it. They're all dirtbags. They all do dirtbag things. Reasonable people do not seek these jobs. And so, you know, it it really just is a sad state of affairs we need higher standards as voters. Let me just say that without weighing in on the individual clauses. I mean, right now, the United States politically, we are steamrolling towards a rematch of 2020. Why on earth would we want to do that? Why would either party want to do that? And I really don't think the only way that's ever going to change is if people stop voting against the other guy. Nobody really votes for anyone anymore. We just vote against the other guy. And because we're voting against the other guy, we will accept anybody who's got a chance of beating him, regardless of what big a scumbag or how much we dislike that person. 
as long as he can beat the other guy, that's good enough for us. And so we end up with horrible, horrible candidates on both sides. We need higher standards. That's my take on politics in general. And I think more, more everyday people need to vote in primaries for that to happen, because right now the extremes of both parties control the primaries. And so you end up with the resultant candidates to choose from based on what the extremes of both parties have chosen. Do you think uh, the uh, divisiveness in the U.S. Uh, and the problems with the uh, financial system, the banking system, uh, could uh, lead to some kind of uh, crisis, <laughs> uh, that geopolitical crisis? And and here I'm I'm thinking about China and Taiwan. That that could, uh, yeah, maybe even strengthen the the current incumbent and uh, help him <laughs> get reelected because. Uh, a war president is always like a difficult to unsee. Uh, we've we've seen that time and time again throughout history, right? You, you had the the ruling military junta in Argentina. Things weren't going well in the eighties, and so here we had this decades, even centuries old conflict over the Falkland Islands. That they decided, you know what? Let's distract from how bad things are. Let's invade the Falkland Islands, and so. A war breaks out over this unimportant island in the middle of the ocean that nobody really cares about. We've seen that during the one impe the last impeachment, um, or I should say the next to last, um, Clinton lobbed a few cruise missiles in the middle of his impeachment hearing because, well, wartime presidents get elected and it's 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 good politics, unfortunately. Um, and you're also seeing this in Venezuela right now. You've got an economic just calamity in Venezuela. You've got an entire nation of people dumpster diving for something to eat. And now, okay, here is this more than a century old conflict over the Guyana Essequibo region. Let's fight over that. It seems like that's the next conflict to break out is going to be between Guyana and Venezuela. And I'm sure, you know, like every other conflict in the world, the U.S. is going to feel compelled to take a side and start dropping bombs there as well. Um, You've got conflicts breaking out in the Red Sea right now, missiles being fired at container ships and at tankers. And U.S. Navy is effectively in a naval in a naval war right now in the Red Sea because on a, almost a daily basis, U.S. destroyers are intercepting drones or missiles and missiles are being fired at commercial shipping. And then, of course, you've got Taiwan, which, you know, another thing I'm watching out for in 2024 is the Chinese banking sector and the fallout from the commercial real or the real estate collapse in China well, you've got this century-old conflict over this island. It really resembles the Falklands a lot in that way. And, well, how do you distract people from losing everything in the real estate market? Give them somebody to shoot at and reflect that anger outwards. So that that's it's a very dangerous thing, I think. The, geopolitically, the world is a tinderbox right now. You've got a lot of very poor leaders, um, a lot of – and on both sides, by the way, our leadership, their leadership, east-west, across the board – they all suck. I, I despise them all equally. Um, and it's worrying what they might do as the economy turns south. So uh, what are you doing to protect yourself and your family uh, financially, let's say spiritually and uh, so socially in terms of, uh, you know, the community? Uh, maybe, you know, you could talk about that. So the viewers have an idea, you know, um, about what uh, what you're doing and how you're trying to, uh, you know, maybe even thrive in these uh, turbulent times. Uh, um, I mean, my my approach has been pretty consistent over the last year. Gold, silver, and Bitcoin. I like all three. Um, removing money from the fiat system, and you know, yesterday that was made abundantly clear that that was the right move. Uh, gold and silver both did very well yesterday. Even Bitcoin did very well yesterday. I know you're not a, a big fan of Bitcoin. If you're not a fan of Bitcoin, gold and silver will do just fine in that environment. Bitcoin has a different risk reward profile, but there's some overlap between, you know, the, the fiat exit ramp, if you will. Uh, so, you know, financially, that's my approach there because monetary debasement, if you think they're running deficits and they're debasing the money right now, if a war breaks out, especially a war between a near peer adversary like China militarily, you've seen nothing yet. I mean, what the deficits would do. I mean, we're kind of seeing this in in Ukraine as we've we're, we've been sending over, you know, these HIMARS systems, 
these javelin missiles, which are very sophisticated and deadly effective on the battlefield, but they're also outrageously expensive. And we're already having trouble supplying enough of these things to the Ukrainians. If we were to get into a conflict with the Chinese, especially a naval conflict over Taiwan, the volume of missiles that would be flying through the air and the cost associated with that and the amount of ancillary cost, because we can't produce these things very fast. So if a conflict, especially a naval conflict, were to break out, the amount of money that would be required to build facilities to manufacture these expensive missiles would be so outrageous that it would the only hope would be massive monetary debasement to finance something like that. It, I think we're talking about numbers that would probably our imaginations limit us in this case. Um, as far as, you know, for the family, I've always said the worse things get globally, the more you need to shrink your circle. All right. If you see things getting bad on a global basis, then improve your situation on a local basis. Um, get to know a local farmer. Um, you know, I, I've been having discussions with some local farmers, you know, friends of the family, parents of kids, friends. Um, you know, hey, we, if if it came to a, an SHTF scenario, would you take silver for a farm share? Would you take Bitcoin for a farm share? You know, finding alternate means of putting food on the table during times of scarcity. Um, it's it's not something where I would necessarily thrive in that environment. I don't buy gold and silver to thrive. I buy gold and silver to improve my worst case scenario. And I think that's probably why gold and silver is so popular with the prepper crowd as well, because preppers are all about doing better in the worst case scenario, not necessarily doing great under today's circumstances, but preventing, you know, raising the floor, if you will. And that's the overlap between the prepping and the finance community. I think we've seen there. Yeah. And um, so, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. I, I, I touched a lot of bases there, didn't I? Yeah, I <laughs> Oh, hold on. I, I remember what. So, yeah, and, and we're talking about China, Taiwan here, and we're, we we are not even like covering like what's going on uh, between Israel and Hamas that that could that's another like a uh, wild card. Uh, let's start again. <laughs> and Jack, uh, yeah, we spoke about the geopolitics and China and Taiwan and, the uh, you know, the uh, potential crisis there. But we already have one right now that seems to have gone off the radar, but is potentially also very, uh, could be very disruptive for uh, energy, uh, and that is Israel and Hamas. Uh, how do you see that uh, evolving? I, I tell you, globally, with the Israel-Hamas conflict, as, as awful as it's been, the world has dodged a bullet when it comes to energy thus far. It it has not spilled over. I think that's largely because the Saudis and the Iranians chose not to get directly involved. I, I think the Iranians in particular are getting involved through proxies, like with the Houthis and through funding Hamas and possibly Hezbollah in northern Lebanon. Um, but they haven't gotten directly involved. You know, early on, there was fears like, could we see mines in the Strait of Hormuz again? Could we see the Iranians firing missiles at tankers where the, you know a quarter of the world's oil flows through the Strait of Hormuz? We haven't seen that yet. We've seen something similar in the Red Sea with the Houthis, who are an Iranian proxy, but we haven't seen it in that all-important Strait of Hormuz. So if that conflict escalates further, that could definitely spill over. And you're talking worldwide economic calamity if that were to happen. Um, you're talking, you know, that would be that would really round out the whole "Are we back in the 1970s?" thing. If we were to get some kind of a blockage in the Strait of Hormuz from the Iranians, um, interestingly enough, what we're starting to see a little bit along with this conflict, and, and let me just preface by saying we're we're not going to resolve a generations old Israeli Palestinian conflict on YouTube, uh, and you know, obviously it is not a black and white scenario, um, but I do think the slaughter of women and children is black and white that that is wrong. I, I don't think it's we're going too far out on a limb to say that. Um, colleges here in the United States, we saw something interesting in the last few weeks with, you know, these politicians who call themselves university presidents afraid to condemn the targeting of women and children because of fear of political backlash. And now that's starting to hit them in the wallet because the donors are saying, heck no to that. You expect me to keep financing your institution when you're saying these things or refusing to condemn this, 
Um, these colleges, especially some of the big Ivy League colleges, they're the way their endowments work, they're basically giant hedge funds with a school attached. And so the donors are starting to cut off these institutions. I don't think we've ever seen anything like that and what that, what that might look like. That's kind of another one of those wild cards for 2024 is if the cash stops flowing into some of these massive college endowments, could you actually see some kind of financial echoes or ripples of that on Wall Street? We've never seen anything like that before. Um, but you know, you got guys like Bill Ackman, who I'm definitely not a fan of Bill Ackman for other reasons, but the guy's a billionaire and he has been just blasting the Ivy League, Harvard in particular recently. I don't think you can bank on checks from these people anymore. And that's how these institutions continue to keep their endowments so well funded. And you're talking a lot of money involved in these colleges. So that's going to be interesting to watch in 2024 as well. Yeah, I, re I remember uh, some years ago, uh, Larry Summers, who who was uh, Secretary of the Treasury, he became, was the president of Harvard or something, and he lost a couple of billion for their endowment. So yeah, that that, that could be a black swan, like uh, the big Ivy League schools losing all their funding. Uh, so uh, Jack, um, yeah, I'd like to thank you for coming on the channel. I always enjoy enjoy speaking with you and uh, want to wish you and your family a Merry Christmas and a happy and prosperous new year. Same to you, Mario. Merry Christmas. And thanks again. It's always a pleasure talking.